Welcome to Sheboygan County Government, working for you. My name is Adam Payne, County Administrator and co-host of this program with Chairman Roger Distruti. And as you know, every month we strive to focus on a different department and often have a different department head here. And today we have Mr. Tom Agerbrecht with us, the Director of the Health and Human Services Department. Welcome, Tom. Thanks, Adam. Let's set the stage by just sharing a little bit about yourself. When were you hired as our director? Uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Well, I've been here for not quite five years, hired in August of 2009. Worked for Brown County 11 years prior to that and Manitowoc County for 10 years prior to that and worked down in the Milwaukee area for a number of years too. But uh, by far, this is the best place to be and I'm so glad to be here. Well, we're glad to have you here. I can't believe how the time has, has flown. I know. 2009. Interesting. Tom is one of 19 department heads that I have the pleasure of working with, but works with the largest department, a budget of a little over $31 million, a lot going on in that department, and um, a lot of activity outside the front door <laughs> right now with some remodeling. But before we get into that, Share a little bit about the different roles and responsibilities of the Health and Human Services Department and the, the divisions that you oversee. Sure. Yeah, we, um, our work is authorized, required under Chapter 46 of the state statutes. All counties across the state have to provide what I describe as, as health and, and well-being services for county residents, and we do that with about 178 employees. We have four operating divisions, and that includes our public health division, our social services division, uh, community programs, which includes elder services, and we offer economic support assistance as well. And we do that in uh, actually four separate locations. We have our main offices on A Street across from Fountain Park. Uh, we have our economic support operation located at the Job Center, which is on Wilgus Road near Taylor Drive. We have an Aging and Disability Resource Center, uh, which is in Sheboygan Falls on Forest Avenue. And we actually have three staff assigned to the Sheboygan Area School District. They work out of a school called Tower Academy, and they work in the interest of kids that are served in that setting. So while it's not an official work location for us, we do have staff assigned there. So um, all of those locations, all of those staff uh, to provide safety net services for the county. When you say safety net services, please give our viewers a little bit of a flavor for that. What type of services are provided? Well, uh, again, um, at times there's persons who are uh, vulnerable, subject to neglect or abuse. That includes children. Uh, we've got elder abuse that occurs as well. It's not uncommon for older persons to be taken advantage of by uh, acquaintances, even family members, and there's times that we have to go in and investigate that. Uh, our juvenile justice services um, uh, respond to a variety of community needs and typically that's uh, providing community protection as much as it is trying to help kids get on a better path. So when kids get involved in juvenile crime and end up in bad spots, we step in and try to correct that path a little bit. And then through behavioral health, um, there's a lot of folks who are experiencing a, a lot of difficulties, have limited means, limited payment resources available to them, so we assess those needs and step in and help when and where we can. Nice, nice overview. A lot mm -hmm. of people receiving service throughout Sheboygan County mm -hmm. and from all walks of life. Correct. Well, back to the front door, if someone has driven by your main headquarters by across from Fountain Park there in mm -hmm. Sheboygan, mm -hmm. certainly they've seen that there's some major construction in play. What's happening? Yeah, it's kind of interesting. I've had some uh, curious questions in recent weeks. You know, I've had people asking me, so is your building being torn down? The answer is no. I say, is your building closed? I say, the answer is no. The most interesting one was someone said, wow, your building really looks better. And I'm thinking, <laughs> where did that come from? Because if you drive by, it's really in a state of disarray, and I'm not sure what they're looking at. I think what they're referring to is uh, that the... Uh, the exterior tiling on the north end of our building has been removed in order to uh, uh, approach this construction project that we're involved in. The south end of the building still has the tile intact, so I think they're concluding that the tile on the south end is new and that the north end is going to look like that, but in reality uh, we are going through a major construction project. We're going to be adding a two-story addition on that building which will improve our lobby, improve our entryway, and um, also add some room space inside. So if you come to the department right now, you can expect to see fencing around the construction zone. 
You can expect to walk through a wooden tunnel that is there to protect visitors from construction debris, but with that, I'm happy to say that we are open for business. $2.2 million addition, mm -hmm. two-story. Mm -hmm. And what were the driving factors for the county board ultimately to authorize that? Well, that building that we're in, Adam, uh, was constructed, I think it was in 1921. You know, it was constructed for uh, application as a medical clinic. And I think it served its purpose very well for many, many years. In a medical clinic, you've got different areas of specialty. It's not essential that each of those areas works together as one department, per se. Um, and the county acquired that property, I believe, in the late 80s in preparation for the creation of our Health and Human Services Department. Prior to that time, there was a separate Department of Social Services, separate Department of Community Programs, and I believe there were two separate public health departments, one operated by the county, one operated by the city. So in 1989, all those departments came together in the form of our Comprehensive Health and Human Services Department. Building was acquired for that application. It probably could have been, maybe should have been, modified at that point, but it wasn't. So today, we've got 250 visitors per day that come through those doors. We have a lobby area in the main entrance that's able to accommodate six persons at a time, which means that all those visitors are cleared to interior spaces in the department where we have four additional reception stations in play. So when that happens, um, information and property security is compromised, people get cleared into the interior of the building and you don't really have close, you know, tabs on where they may be at point in time. Um, it's not efficient to have five separate receptionists operating in the interest of one department. And also consumer privacy is really compromised because when those visitors are cleared to the interior spaces, they're typically waiting in what I would describe as hallways or common areas. So it's just not a comfortable spot for consumers to be. We had a um, operational study done by Virtual Kraus back in 2006 that recognized all of that. Virtual Kraus came in and uh, looked at what we might do to improve efficiencies within our department. And one of the recommendations they made was that if ever we could find the means of creating this new addition that we're talking about today, we would satisfy all of those concerns. We would improve efficiency, we would uh, maximize consumer privacy, we would eliminate some of those security breaches. So it's not a matter of growth that's driving this change, it's more about workflow improvement and efficiency improvement, as well as just the consumer experience coming into our department. It's important to me that when people come to us for assistance and service that they feel comfortable and welcomed when they arrive. So we'll be accomplishing all of those things with this project. It's time, it's, it's a tired building, it's mm -hmm. served its purpose for a long time and it's going to in the future, but it was time for some additional work. I know personally uh, coming over to the building from time to time, whether it's to see you mm -hmm. or for a Health and Human Services Committee meeting, as you said, you walk through that lobby and there are times when people are almost tripping yep. uh, one another because mm -hmm. that lobby is so small. Mm -hmm. And then the other more personal experience for those of us who have been in that facility, whether it's customers or staff alike, some of the bathrooms in that facility are smaller than I think an average person's closet where literally it's difficult to move and being a larger guy, it, it makes me think of the Chris Farley movies uh, <laughs> where uh, he had some challenges with some small bathrooms. but. Uh, that was clear, clearly an area that we had to improve because you pointed out on a number of occasions that if you have clients there with young children, I mean, frankly, it was difficult for some a mother yep. or father to take their child in a restroom and, mm -hmm. and change a diaper or whatever mm -hmm. needs to, to be done. So mm -hmm. really nice to see that improvement. And then, of course, the other one I know you're very excited about is you'll finally have a chance to meet with all of your staff at the mm -hmm. same time. Yep. Yeah, so as a byproduct, where we end up through this project, and I appreciate you mentioning the restroom issue, we have one accessible restroom in our entire building. So we've got, you know, 178 employees and 250 visitors per day, one accessible restroom tucked away in a corner of the third floor. So that's been, you One know, handicapped accessible. One handicapped accessible, right. thank right. you. Yeah, right. that, that's what I mean by there that. There are other ones, but there's, they're very There are other small. ones with two-foot doors on them. Right. It's interesting back in the day how two-foot door met code and 
You'd never get away with that now, so you'd never get a wheelchair through those doors, let alone be able to turn once you're inside. So as a byproduct of all these changes we're going through, our lobby is going to not accommodate six people. It will accommodate 30. Um, we'll have a meeting room on second floor. Our largest meeting room right now accommodates 40. We'll accommodate 128 with this new addition. Um, we're going to have three accessible restrooms added. We'll have centralized reception, so we'll go from five reception staff down to three, and we can use those employees for other purposes. Uh, we're going to have some new exam rooms as part of that addition. So when we had our TB outbreak last year, we had folks with uh, TB walking through the department so they could be seen by public health staff. So that's not a great situation for anyone involved, visitors, staff, or others. So we'll have two rooms in that new addition uh, for, for uh, public health examinations as well as immunizations. So when people come in for shots, people come in for exams, they can do that right off the lobby. One of those rooms will have negative pressure handling attached to it so that uh, we don't have uh, you know, uh, air exchange through, through other than that room, and that'll better protect uh, visitors and staff as well. Um, and so by and large, that's, that's what's going to happen in that addition. We're also going to be moving our business office from a corner of the second floor down to just off that lobby area. There's a lot of folks as they come in uh, to receive services from us that have to check in with our business office, and they contribute toward the cost of their care when they can. They make payments toward that when they can. Having that office in a more consumer-friendly location is going to be an improvement. And then once we get that established, those spaces that are being vacated by our business office are going to be rededicated for administrative office purposes, mine included. Right now, I'm on the third floor as well. Back in a corner of third floor, it's a great place to be, but it's not all that accessible. And I think when people call upon me or want to see me, I'm kind of hidden away a little bit. Um, also, our business manager is in, is in opposite corner of the building on second floor, and our administrative services supervisor uh, is in the middle of the second floor. And quite honestly, I do a lot of activity with those individuals, and being in three different spots within that building isn't maximum. So we're going to repurpose that current business office for administrative office purposes. It'll help our workflow, but it'll also make the director more accessible to anyone who wants to have contact with them. So a uh, lot, lot of activity going on. Excellent, excellent overview, a lot going on, as you said. And final question before I turn it over to Roger, when do you anticipate then the construction is going to be complete? Mm -hmm. Let's, uh, it's going to be a three-phase project. So, so phase number one is, is building that new addition, that new two-story addition that will include our reception area, those exam rooms that I talked about. I neglected to mention we also want to create a central intake office when, within that new addition. And what I mean by that is um, we've got folks that have difficulty navigating are many, many different service areas, knowing who to connect with. And I think just from a customer service perspective, if we could offer assistance there uh, to, to visitors right off the lobby, that would be value added. So that addition is scheduled for completion in October, as things currently stand. Once our staff move into that new addition and vacate the current lobby, that second phase will be reconstruction to create that new billing uh, office, that business office that I described. Mm -hmm. And once that's done, probably around year end, we can then start considering the repurposing of the business office to uh, remodel for administrative purposes. That piece, that phase three, will be handled by our county staff, our building services staff. We don't have a schedule developed for that yet, but the main renovation should be completed about year end. Year end. Yeah. Time for the new year and maybe a oh, house warming around Christmas. Hopefully. Yeah. Very That's good. The plan. Thank you, Tom. Mm -hmm. Roger. Tom, uh, good to have you here and uh, great work that your, uh, your people do. Um, and I know many people, uh, visitors as well as your staff, will appreciate the changes uh, in the Health and Human Services Thanks, building. Thanks, Roger. But I also understand the Aging and Disability Resource Center in Sheboygan Falls uh, will be seeing some improvements as well. Uh, mm -hmm. What is the planning and why, why and where? Why that? Yeah. yeah. 
So yeah, we have a lot going on, and you're right, ADRC <coughs> is going to see some changes as well. So much like um, our main building, that current location for the Aging and Disability Resource Center wasn't designed for that purpose. We moved into that building in 2010, I believe it was. We had previously been leasing space downtown in what was called the Baxter Building, which wasn't the most consumer friendly, wasn't the best environment, and there was a cost, uh, the lease cost connected with it. So our UW Extension offices and vacating the current location in Sheboygan Falls, I think they moved out to uh, the UW Sheboygan grounds. That created opportunity for us to move our ADRC staff and operations into that building. So it's, it's much improved office space. Um, it's more centrally located, so perhaps uh, better for, for many residents of the county but it's not optimal in terms of entrance. So the main entrance on that building, if I'm recalling correctly, faces south. The parking lot is on the north. So when you park to gain access to that building, there is no canopy that protects visitors from the elements. There is no vestibule once you get inside that protects visitors or staff from the north wind when that door is constantly opening and the reception area there is tucked away into a side room right now. You can get there but it's not readily visible when you enter that building. So rather than entering through a service door that is not all that welcoming and what had been a back door for that facility, we're going to give that a facelift as well. So there'll be a new canopy added again to protect people from from the elements as I described. There will be a vestibule added to protect from that north wind and our reception area is going to be moved from the current side office location to uh, close proximity to that entrance. So we expect all of that to be uh, an improved consumer experience as well. That sounds great and when do you expect that to be completed? Um, the timeline on that, we expect that'll happen this year as well, Roger. Not quite as tight a timeline. I can't give you specifics on that. Um, uh, Jim Tabeast of our building services uh, department has been working with the architect and getting final design plans drawn up for that. We just got those done. We have preliminary estimates on cost, but we don't have formal bids yet. So once those are received, I think that project can get started. I would anticipate that might be about year-end as well, as long as Jim can handle all of those projects at the same time. Mm -hmm. And uh, some wonderful projects going on, but where is the money coming from to pay for that? Yeah. Uh, we, we have been blessed. We have been fortunate uh, through the efforts of our staff and uh, I guess just good fortune in general. We've had a number of years in a row of positive budget performance. We've outperformed our budget. We've hit the end of the year uh, with, with uh, fund balance, if you will. So in both applications with our main building, that's about a $2.2 .2 million cost, as Adam described. Uh, we've, we've had uh, uh, significant savings in recent years, some of which have gone to the county's general fund, some of which have been held in fund balance for our department. We're able to draw upon those dollars now in lieu of bonding for this project so there's no new costs being added. Um, and same thing with the ADRC, that's funded through state and federal funds. Last year we outperformed our budget by about $135,000 and the state has given us permission to carry those funds forward in the interest of this project as well as some furnace replacement at the ADRC. So again, no new money is going to be involved, instead we'll use uh, budget allocations from prior years to get both of these projects done. And as anyone knows if they've ever done a, a remodeling uh, work on their own home or anything, there's always some surprises. Uh, electrical or plumbing behind the, mm -hmm. the walls. Have you any, hit any major problems at all? Or? No, um, th there hadn't been anything, uh, you know, that has, has created uh, uh, big challenges. I think our, our early estimates of cost for the main building project uh, weren't quite uh, where they needed to be and I think once the the, the final uh, study got done and sewer laterals needed to be run out to the street and there was an underground uh, fuel storage tank that needed to be removed. And that, and that was a bit of a surprise. 
that, that was a surprise. I don't think they were anticipating that. And so right. that, that uh, had to be dug out before construction could right. even be started. But with, right. with those things in mind, it's been going pretty smoothly and I would say pretty rapidly. So I'm pretty pleased with that progress. And you mentioned some of the things that uh, building services have done in Jim to Beast. Is there any ongoing things that they have to do in the meantime to keep things open for you, or is that pretty well handled by well, the Jim, contractor? Jim, you know, I can't say enough about Jim to Beast. Uh, Jim has just been so tremendous to work with through this this process, and it, it's not like this is just the last few weeks. It was back in 2012 that. Uh, the east facade of our building needed to be replaced. We had a mm -hmm. stucco exterior that was kind of deteriorating. And so Jim planned for that replacement with an eye toward this future addition. So basically since 2012, we've been looking at this project. He meets with the contractor on a bi-weekly basis. He's in contact with us. Um, he's been tremendous to work with. And again, big shout out goes to Jim. Well, thank you very much for the work you do, Tom. Thanks, Thank Roger. And Jim Tabeast, if you're not sure, well, who's Jim Tabeast? He's our building services director. So he mm -hmm. oversees not only this building project, but all building projects throughout mm -hmm. the county. And mm -hmm. there's a lot going on this year. So he's got his hands full and, as you said, is doing a great job. Yep. Switching gears back to the services, back mm -hmm. to where we started a little bit and the very important role and responsibilities of health and human services. Uh, Tom, you and I had the opportunity to attend a meet meeting at Blue Harbor. I think it's been a couple few months now. Mm -hmm. It was a community conversation about mental health. Mm -hmm. And there's been a lot more discussion and focus on mental health uh, challenges and needs, safety yep. net of late, not only in this community, but nationally. Um, please give our viewers a little flavor for, well, what was that meeting at Blue Harbor all about? Who was there? And why did it happen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, estimates, Adam, suggest we have as many as 23,000 county residents any point in time that would have diagnosable mental health concerns. About 5,000 of those individuals would fall in a category of having a serious mental illness. Um, we as a county, and I'm, I'm not happy about this, I'm not proud, and you know, we, we like to focus on the things that are going well, but we outpace state and national averages for suicide. Uh, we outpace state and national averages for lost productivity due to poor mental health days. And we outpace state and national averages for binge drinking. So when you put all that together, you've got tremendous impact on a community from a cost as well as a social perspective. As a department, uh, we spend between one and two million dollars annually on emergency mental health care. That's hospitalization related to mental health care. And that's on behalf of individuals who don't have private insurance, don't have Medicaid. When you start adding those costs into the mix, you can understand how significant that is just from a health care perspective, but then also uh, when it's uh, not treated, when we fail to treat that, uh, we end up with very, very poor outcomes, including suicide. We end up with higher levels of incarceration, uh, and there's costs connected with all of that. So the community came together at that event that you're describing that was uh, organized largely by United Way, uh, our department, Mental Health America, and other agencies to pull together stakeholders in the interest of identifying what we might do to improve upon our health outcomes. So the target was 300 attendees. I think uh, we ended up with 326 attendees, if I'm not mistaken. And it was from all walks of, of life and, and community involvement. So we had legislators there. We had county board members there. We had law enforcement there. We had providers there, families, consumers you name it, so it was really quite gratifying in the interest of trying to come up with better recommendations for how we as a community, and it's not just Health and Human Services, it's not just Sheboygan County, it is all players, all stakeholders across the community that have a role to play in making improvements, and the, the day was dedicated to try to come up with those answers. And in my tenure, in my experience as a county administrator, I can't recall ever experiencing or people from all walks of life 
mm -hmm. and all sorts of different positions, roles and responsibilities in this community all came together for a full day mm -hmm. to seriously consider the challenges we have here and then start brainstorming a little bit, well, what can we do better? And what are some of the emerging themes that came out of that conference? Yeah, well, one thing that I think struck me, and you and I had a chance to talk about this as well, it was pretty amazing when you get 300 plus people in a room all uh, organized around a central theme, you would expect that there might be some commonality of knowledge and experience that those people would bring. But we found quite the opposite. And there were folks sharing tables who are in the service delivery system who had no knowledge of what their counterparts were doing right. or what the access points were for gaining that, that type of care. So two, two main themes for me were a lot of committed people interested in solving this problem, but a whole lot of work to be done in terms of how, how we can bring that common knowledge up. So I think the central themes of that day were we have to improve education, we have to improve access, and we have to improve uh, service coordination if we're going to make a difference. And we, uh, we only have a couple of minutes remaining, mm -hmm. so I know that very shortly you're going to be developing a proposed 2015 budget for right. the Health and Human Services Department. Mm -hmm. Any uh, new initiatives that you know were supported by that discussion that you're looking at mm -hmm. proposing to the full county board? Well, I think, first of all, we want to be a good partner. I think we want to do this in, in collaboration with other uh, community players. But with that said, um, we're actively pursuing a concept of helpline. And what that means is a, a resource that consumers can call. We have a crisis line right now. We'd like people to have a place they can call before they get to crisis. We're working on that. We're going to see if we can't establish a central intake position within our department. We're also partnering with Washington, Ozaki, and Dodge counties to access some new state mental health funds that the governor approved only available on a regional basis and we're working with those counties in the interest of expanding those services. Well, we talked about a lot in a very little amount of time, but wonderful overview, uh, tremendous improvements being made to the Health and Human Services Department and other buildings, but more importantly, just a lot of good work being done by Tom and his staff to deliver critical programs and services to people in need in this community. And as Roger said earlier, Tom, I want to thank you for your leadership and the good work that you and your staff do. I want to thank you guys for the opportunity. It's been great. It's always good to have you here, and it's always good to have you here. Uh, next month, we're going to be focusing on another important area in Sheboygan County, and that's our Human Resources Department. Jean Gallimore, our HR Director, will be here, and she's going to talk about some new initiatives in HR. There's been quite a few changes since Act 10 at the state level, and uh, roles and responsibilities, policies and procedures, uh, focus more on professional development training in the county and just a lot going on. So I'm looking forward to Jean talking about some of the new initiatives. And if you have any suggestions for improvement or if there was something in this program today you heard or you'd like to learn more about, don't hesitate to contact your county board supervisor, myself or Tom Agerbrecht, and uh, certainly pass on those ideas or where we can provide more information. So on behalf of Roger Destruti, and thanks again, Tom Eggerbeck, for joining us, and myself, Adam Payne, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next month.